first of all, thank you all for having me here today. Um, I've known Steve and Susie for a long time, and I've heard nothing but nice things about the church, and so it's, it's an honor and a, and, a, and a pleasure to be here. Um, and it speaks well of you, too. Not very many churches will allow the old guy to hang around afterwards. And so that, that speaks to your love and kindness, and uh, it is, it's a very good thing. Um, this is Communion Sunday, but one of the most important things about a communion sermon is that it be short. No one wants to be here an extra half an hour. So I'm going to just try and share a few words with you today on the uh, benefits of amateur status. I want to say a few words in praise of being an amateur, and I believe that these are uh, scripturally based. Uh, we live in a world in which we think we have to have professionals to do anything. We have professionals fix our cars, we have professionals fix our houses, we have professionals teach our children, and we come to believe after a while that, that only professionals are capable of doing things. And uh, it's so much so that the term amateur has become an insult, kind of a term of derision. Well, he's, he's only an amateur, as if that's a bad thing. Um, this is a pretty recent development in terms of language. Amateur hasn't always meant that. Amateur is from the Latin word amator, which means lover. So an amateur is someone who does something because they love it, not because they're paid or because they have to. So an, an amateur is a really good thing. Now, I'm an attorney by background. I practiced law for 10 years, got some time off good behavior. And, but I was practically born a professional. My mother was an attorney. And she practiced law out of our home the whole time that I was growing up. My dad was an anesthesiologist, doctor, who then went back to law school inexplicably when I was age 10 and became a lawyer. So I grew up in a house with two attorneys as parents. This changes things, right? I'm uh, working the scene one day. I'm playing mom up against dad, trying to get permission to go somewhere. And I had dad and had to go back to mom. And I went to my mom and mom said, I said, mom, dad says it's okay. My mother said, I'm not making this up. I still don't want you to go, whatever it was. The opinion of your father to the contrary, notwithstanding. <laughs> I thought that was English until I was 26 years old. I was in law school and I heard that phrase. I said, so that's why mom talks like that. So I've been a professional almost from birth. But as I look at my life, I find that my greatest joys and the achievements that actually matter have all occurred in situations in which I'm an amateur. I am, for example, an amateur husband. I have been an amateur husband for almost 32 years. This is a miracle because I married a kind and patient woman. Because my natural disposition is that of an overly confident, somewhat selfish ass. <laughs> if left to my own devices, I'm basically a selfish ass. But I have a kind wife and we have a loving guy. And over the last 30 plus years, Susan, my wife, would tell you that I have become less of an ass. This is one of the great achievements of my life. And it's because I'm an amateur, a lover. I love my life. And I work at being less of an ass. And slowly over time, that's paying off. Well, I'm an amateur Bible teacher. I teach the Bible quite a bit in a lot of different settings. And uh, it's, it's a lot of fun, and as I'll tell you later on, people are kind to me in that setting. Because I'm an amateur, because they know that I'm going to work Monday morning just like they are, if I say something wrong or I make a mistake, whatever, they kind of go away. If I was paid, they'd be sitting there thinking, hmm, who knows the bishop? Maybe we can move this guy along, okay? Maybe we can get somebody else in here. And so there's, there's, there's some benefits to uh, amateur status. Uh, I'm an amateur basketball player. I started playing when I was 50. And I completely love the game. Now, when I say amateur, I, I mean amateur in the sense that, that nobody has ever asked me after a game in the last 10 years if I played college ball. 
nobody has ever asked me after a game in the last 10 years if I played high school ball. Because it's obvious by my skill set that I didn't play either. Right? But I love it. I'm out there I'm having a great time and, and, uh, and really enjoying it. I'm an amateur dad. Uh, I have three great kids, two girls and a boy. The girls are both married to fine young men. And while I wouldn't take credit for this, I'm not here to say these are great kids who married well because of me. I helped. I did help as a mentor, a lover of my children. And in that, that, that setting, I was helping. And I continue to be helping. But I'm an amateur. In all of these areas, there's in all of our lives, there's constant pressure on us to become professionals. That pressure is everywhere. You have alpha parenting at our church years and years ago. We had active parenting. And I was recruited to go to the Kennedy Active Parenting class, which I perceived as an effort of becoming more professional as a parent. And I told the Lord, I said, I, I believe in active parenting. I am an active parent. <laughs> she was appalled, and I discovered the first benefit of amateur status. I was never again asked to go to the class. <laughs> so I got this first taste of freedom. And one of the things that I, the main thing I want to share with you today is that I believe that we have a people, as a people, have forgotten our church history, which is to say that the early church was built entirely by amateurs. The early church was built by amateurs. There weren't any professionals. And when Paul writes his very first letter, the letter we're going to look at briefly today, to the Christians at Thessalonica, he expressly endorses amateur status. And part of that is because of his own experience. So let me set the stage for you. Paul had been traveling around as a missionary in Asia, minor, modern-day Turkey. And he has a vision that he's supposed to go over to Macedonia, which is northern Greece. So he goes over there and to, to uh, preach and teach and, and start churches. First he goes to the city of Philippi. Well, in Philippi, he is stripped, beaten, flogged, arrested, thrown in a jail, and then asked to leave town. So that's his, that's his experience in Philippi. From Philippi, he goes south a little ways to Thessalonica, the city where the Christians are that the letter is written to, we're going to look at today. In Thessalonica, his preaching starts a riot, and he has to leave town. He then goes south to the next town of Berea, and in Berea, his preaching starts a riot, and he has to leave town. So he's got, you know, arrested, beaten, flogged, thrown into prison, leaves town, starts a riot, leaves town, goes to the next city, starts a riot, has to leave town. Now he's in Athens. Athens is a very sophisticated place, at least in their own minds. Kind of a university town. And so Paul tries to be very sophisticated, and he quotes the Greek poets and philosophers argues with them. And the Greeks essentially laugh at him. And uh, Luke, who writes this history for us, tries to put some lipstick on the pig and make it look good. Luke says that a few people became Christians. But what we know about Athens is that it's one of the few places where Paul failed to start a church. And so he moves south from there to Corinth. So Paul basically limps into Corinth. He's been arrested and beaten, thrown out of town, thrown out of town, and then been a colossal failure in Athens. And now he's in Corinth. And two things happen in Corinth that, that really make a huge difference. First, he runs into Aquila and Priscilla, two Jews, tent makers, living in Corinth because the emperor Claudius had thrown all the Jews out of Rome. So they throw all the Jews out of Rome. These two Jewish tent makers go and settle in Corinth. Paul used to be a tent maker. He meets them and goes hanging out with them, and he gets a job. Paul gets a job. He goes to work as a tent maker. He, what, he becomes, if you will, a professional. He becomes a professional tent maker. But as he's an amateur, a mentor, a lover, as a preacher, teacher, and evangelist. He's a professional tent maker. He's a, an amateur Christian, if you will. He's 
doing that on the side. And his ministry flourishes. It flourishes in part because he got a job. This is advice that we can easily give to most of the 20 and 30 year olds. is that Timothy, one of his assistants, comes back from Thessalonica and he tells Paul, guess what? You're not a failure. The church in Thessalonica is in fact flourishing. And this is the very first moment that Paul knows that his ministry wasn't failing. And so he picks up a pen and writes a letter to them. And that letter is the letter that we know as so-called First Thessalonians. It's a letter that Paul writes after he learns for the first time that he hadn't been a failure. Right? And this letter was written, we know exactly what it was written, roughly in AD 50, which is only 20 years after the resurrection. So in modern terms, if you think about it, this would be 20 years after Bill Clinton became president. We don't want to tell Bill Clinton that. We don't want to associate him with the resurrection. He probably thinks highly enough of himself as it is. But we all remember the Clinton presidency. That's how recent this is, this letter is, to the uh, resurrection and to, to the life of Christ. This is the oldest thing we have in, in, the, in the New Testament. So Timothy comes into town and says, guess what? Great news. You were a failure. Paul picks up his pen and he writes this letter. And the first three quarters of the letter is just incredible thanks and praise. I'm so thankful that you guys have hung in there, that you're doing well. I've been praying for you. I've been worried about you. I've been worried sick. At one point he says, when I could stand it no more, I sent Timothy off to find out how you were doing. And he's just come back and told me that things are great. So we have this wonderful expression of joy and thanksgiving from Paul. Then he settles down to give them some advice. Now bear in mind, this is the first advice he's ever written down to a very young church. These people have been Christians for a couple of years. If we were going to give them advice, you know, what might that be? What, what would we expect Paul to write? Um, work really hard at becoming full-time professional Christians. Start a school, a college, and a seminary so that you can train people. So if you're Lutherans, start an insurance company. <laughs> Be sure you have ordination standards so that you're only hiring professionals. Engage in service ministries. Commit yourself to global evangelism. Those are all, all kinds of things that are sent to us in some way, shape, or form today. Paul doesn't say any of those. What he says is, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and work with your hands, just as we told you. So that your daily life will win the respect of outsiders and won't be dependent on anybody. Go well. Make it your ambition to live quietly. It's written to a group of people, so implicit in this is make it your ambition to live quietly in your community of faith with your friends. And and the, the advice is shocking to the Greek ear, as it is in some ways to ours. How many people here are parents? Let me see what show of hands. An awful lot. How many of you parents have ever said to your kids, you know, honey, we really don't care if you go to college. We're happy if you just pursue a trade. One, two, okay? Two, three. So it's, uh, <laughs> so it's unusual advice in our day. It was even more unusual advice in Paul's day. People who worked with their hands, for the most part, were lower classes or slaves. So he's, he's, he's encouraging this, this low lifestyle, in essence. Make it your ambition for Lead a quiet life to mind your own business, work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life will win the respect of outsiders and won't be dependent on anybody. What about all the church stuff? What about all the other stuff? For all the church stuff, for all the other stuff, we're supposed to be amateurs, amator, lovers. We just do those things because we want it, not because we're paid or not because we have to. Now, there is tremendous freedom in amateur status. I get great joy as a husband. I get great joy as a dad. I get great joy as a Bible teacher. I get great joy as a basketball player. I have a regular Sunday morning game before church in my neighborhood. 
with a group of 35 to 40 year olds, mostly Chinese and Korean guys. So this is the game where I get to post up down low like how to solve it. Because I'm taller than everybody else, right? And last Sunday, I was standing out there, the game's about to begin, and the guys on the other team were talking about who's going to guard Bob. As if it matters. <laughs> I was so flattered, I couldn't believe it. And then the clouds parted, the sun shone, the Lord smiled on me, and I scored the first three baskets. This was, I felt like Simeon in the temple when he saw the baby Jesus. My life is complete. <laughs> now I can go in peace. Uh, and this is fantastic. It, it's, it's a benefit of, of amateur status. Another benefit of being amateurs, amateur lovers, uh, is freedom. Uh, years ago, I was on the ruling group at our church. I don't know what it's called here. In our church, it's called the session. And it really felt like a job. Constant meetings, late nights. It just felt like work. And so I did something really unusual. I quit. I had middle of my term. Nobody ever does that. I just quit. And I went and taught fifth grade at Sunday school. And then I taught fourth grade and sixth grade. And then I wrote the Sunday school curriculum that we still use 15 years later. And then I started teaching adult classes. And I just taught, taught, taught. Because that's what I'm called to do. Right? And uh, because I was an amateur, I could do that. I could quit and go do what I'm supposed to do. And it was, it was, it was, it was really pretty good. Amateur Christians can go places and talk to people that other people can't, that professional Christians can't. When I traveled to Atlanta pretty frequently on business, I played basketball down there. And I used to play at a gym called Crunch. And many a night, I was the only white guy. And I couldn't go hang with those guys as a pastor. I couldn't walk in with my Bible study and say, hey guys, how about Bible study, right? But I could go in as a basketball player for sports. I'm playing there one night, and I'm trying to drive to the lane and score. And one of the guys that works at the gym was on the other team. He's a little shorter than I am, but he was like 210 and cut. This guy's a stud. And he goes up to block my shot, and we slam into each other. He comes straight down as if nothing happened. I bounce off him, fall on my back, and slide about 15 feet. And I'm looking up at an ocean of black faces looking down at me. And I can't use the language that they were using here in church. But the essence of what they were saying was, oh my gosh, we killed our own white guy. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's an incredible thing. But as an amateur, I have something that I never thought I would ever have, which is to say, young black friends. <laughs> I never thought that would happen. And it would never happen with me in any kind of professional role. Right? They don't need money management or attorneys, they play basketball. So you can go places as an amateur um, that you can't go as a professional. And it's, it's, it's very, very cool. So what should we do? Well, I think what we should do is embrace our amateur status. We're amateurs, amateurs, lovers. And we should embrace that. If you want to be in a Bible study, you want to start a Bible study, how do you do that? You take a Bible. Okay. You go to a friend. You say, would you like to spend a Bible with me? He says, yes. You now have a Bible study. That's all it takes. Okay. When he says, what should we study? You say, I don't know. Let's study the text that the pastor preaches on. I never understood a word he says. Maybe we can figure it out on our own. Right? It's simple. It's simple. If you want to do outreach, you want to be more evangelical, Hold your Bible study uh, in the patio outside Starbucks. And just be nice guys. And sooner or later, somebody will ask you what you're doing. Because they were reading the Bible, we don't understand. Maybe you can help. And they'll sit down and join you. It really does happen. I've got a brand new friend the last three, four months. Wonderful guy. His wife was thrown from a horse a year and a half ago, had a horrible brain injury, and he's been doing nothing but take care of her ever since. And it just is a very young Christian. He doesn't know John the Baptist from you know, a kick in the head. And, and as we've got to talk, uh, it's been so much fun because we dig into the Bible together and he has all these very sincere questions and I just answer them as best I can. And uh, 
He said, well, I would never normally sit down next to a guy with a Bible, but you're okay. And, and I think it's because my basic ass personality kind of shows, and he knows that I'm just one of him, and that I'm not a pro, and it's okay. Um, service. So many service opportunities. Do you like to cook? Can you fix things? If you can either cook or fix things, somewhere within a mile radius of your house are a dozen young couples whose marriage is struggling in part because they can't cook and they can't fix things. And they're paying for everything. So they're spending 110% of their income paying for things. Invite the girl over on Saturday morning to bake a pie. She doesn't know that it's possible to bake a pie. She believes pies are things you buy at the market. Okay? If, the, uh, if the dishwasher goes, I mean, the, the garden disposal goes out, go fix it for him. Maybe you don't want to start there if you're not handy. But, but uh, that's, that's a more challenging repair. But whatever, right? And there's so many opportunities. You could do the things you love. You want to be a good witness to the community as Christians? Be helpful. Be helpful. Embrace your amateur status. Be helpful. Um, and and the, the thing that is so amazing is that the early church had no political power, no economic power, nothing of the nature of civil rights. Probably half the early Christians were slaves. And yet, in a couple of hundred years, they transformed the Roman Empire from a pagan culture to a Christian culture just by being local, loving, competent, helpful people. So when Paul is saying, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and mind your own business and the work of your hands, so that you can be helpful, he really means it. It has a component of service, of evangelism, and outreach. And it's something that absolutely any of us can do. And I, I believe if you do that, um, the day may come when the, the, the clouds are sun shines, and the voice from heaven will say to you, who's going to go to Bob? Or whatever your equivalent of that is. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you call us to be amateurs, amateurs, lovers, people who do things just because we love them. Help us to embrace that, do it quietly, Those around us might know and experience the love of Jesus Christ through us. And it's in his name.